Could we now talk about the influence of the internet on the perception of the church by the person? Yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm increasingly um, of the mind that the internet is really, at the end of the day, fundamentally counterproductive for Christianity. And I say this with a little smile because I, as far as I'm aware, was one of the very first people to create a, an internet presence dedicated to orthodoxy. When the World Wide Web first began, there were four orthodox websites. I know this is hard for people to understand now and there are millions, literally millions of them now. But for many years, there were just four. And one of them uh, was one that I started. Uh, and initially, I believed that the internet could be a great tool for orthodoxy. Uh, certainly what I used it for was to try to make people familiar with the Fathers, to publish writings of the Fathers, which at that time were very hard to find if you weren't in a university and had access to libraries. So there is, and there still is, even today, a sense in which that ability to access materials is a gift, and we shouldn't even when I get very discouraged by the internet, I still must remind myself that, that is a blessing. That if you want to know uh, the writings of St. Palladius, or if you want to know the writings of St. Romanos, uh, it used to be you had to go on a kind of pilgrimage to find w what library has these books, how can I go there, how can I get in, how long can I stay. Uh, now you can just go on your mobile phone and within 30 seconds you can have all these writings uh, in whatever language you happen to speak. Uh, and if you don't speak the language that they're in, you can push another button on the phone and it'll translate it for you into... Uh, these are amazing things. However, the internet has changed a lot since the early days when it was just transmitting materials. And one of the biggest problems that Christians have today that particularly Orthodox Christians have, is the internet since the advent of social media has really fostered this idea that everyone has the right and the, almost the obligation to speak about everything and to have an opinion about everything. And the idea of authority has changed from someone who has received instruction and gained wisdom in a relationship to simply who can affect the largest number of hearers. And there is this kind of implicit idea that the more popular a, a, a message is or an article is or a post is, that it somehow is truer or more meaningful. But this is a, a kind of nonsense idea when you take a step back. If I say a complete falsehood but manage to convince 10,000 people that I'm right, it doesn't actually make me right. I've just convinced 10,000 people and now they're as wrong as I am. And if I can convince 10 million people, that similarly does not make my argument any more correct than it was when I invented it. Um, orthodoxy has always worked on the principle of personal transmission. From the very beginning, the disciples sat at the feet of Christ and Christ not only told them what he wanted them to know, but how they were to understand it. And if you read especially the parts of the Gospel relating to the Apostles, the most common question that the Apostles ask Christ is, can you please explain what you just said again? We didn't understand it. So he gives them the parable, for example, of you know, loving your neighbor. And their first question is, well, who's my neighbor? What is love? Um, he gives the parable of the sower sowing seed on different kinds of soil. And their question is, well, that's beautiful, what does it mean? So not, not only does he give them the materials, the data, the truth, but he also teaches them how to understand it. Both through his words, but also through his life. He tells them that they must love their enemies. And he explains this to them. and He gives them stories, parables about it. But ultimately, the greatest way that he shows them what it means to love your enemies is when they witness him dying on the cross and saying to the very people who are killing him, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Right? In this way, the apostles learned what it means to love your enemy. Because in and of itself, the phrase is meaningless. If I say to you, you know, love your neighbor, 
Well, that can mean anything you want it to mean. You know, it can mean demand that your neighbor do everything the way you want him to do it. It can mean let your neighbor do anything that he wants, no matter how damaging it might be to himself or to other people, or anything in between. You have to be shown, we all do, what this is supposed to mean. And orthodoxy has always worked on this principle, that we sit at the feet of our elders, and they give us, they transmit to us the gospel, and how we are to live it and understand it. And then we, in turn, to the degree that God gives us, the responsibility, the grace, we then hand it on to the next generation. But when I can simply go online and type in, what is St. Athanasius' view about love? Or what does the church teach about this sin or that sin? That's not the same thing as sitting at the feet and listening. Or people who think that they can go on the internet and just type in you know, quotes from the fathers about forgiveness, and they can read and compile 15 different quotations from the church fathers and think that they then understand what forgiveness means. Nonsense. You know, just to be able to read a sentence out of the gospel or a sentence out of this saint's writing, that's not the same thing as having wisdom. It's not the same thing as understanding what these fathers are saying. To me, this is the greatest danger posed by the internet world and the social media world, is that people have lost not only the habit, but even the desire to go and to humble themselves, to sit at the feet of a teacher. Look at the way the world regards experts. Expert has become a bad word, right? Or the experts say this, the, but expert should be a good word. Right? In principle, you can pervert anything, but in principle, someone who dedicates their life to understanding something by being taught by other people should be the person you want to listen to. Right? And it's the same way in the church. But when we walk into the church and we think, I can find it all out for myself, I can go on the internet and get all the opinions that I want, and even though my interpretation is different from yours, you know, I've been on this forum where 20,000 people all reject that. But this is meaningless in a church point of view. We need to reclaim the ancient practice of humbly submitting ourselves to that which is given to us by the church. And if I can just add one, uh, some people tell me the things that I say that get passed around and respread. Apparently I'm rather well known for saying, no one cares what you think. Uh, which is true. I say it a lot. It needs, <laughs> you need to know why I say it. I say this a lot to people because very often when we have conversations about church life uh, and I listen to them when they're learning about orthodoxy or they're thinking of converting and I hear constantly, well, I think this. Or, I think that the veneration of the saints is good, but I have a question about this. Or I think making prostrations is, is positive, but I worry about this and that. Or, I think that the holy canon should be followed this far, but not here. And at some point, I generally kind of put my hand like this and with a, a little bit of a smile say, my dear brother, my dear sister, no one cares what you think. Right? The church is not a place where we consolidate the thoughts and the opinions of people and say, here's what we'll do in response. The church is the place where Christ says, this is the truth, take it or leave it. You have to take it with a grain of salt. Of course we care what each other thinks. Our understanding is part of who we are. Uh, our struggles to understand uh, need to be responded to and embraced and corrected. But at the end of the day, the joy of the Christian is that I do not define what is right or what is wrong. It's not my understanding that is the final judge. Uh, and it's not the mob either. Even if it's a good Christian mob, it's still just a mob. It's Christ himself. So if we can use the internet to receive information, but at the same time constantly remind ourselves that information in and of itself is just raw data. It's like a paintbrush. A paintbrush in and of itself can't do anything. Someone still has to show you how to move it. I, I, I'm a very bad iconographer, but I still like to paint icons just as a, an act of spiritual devotion. Uh, and one of the things that you learn very quickly is I can have all the supplies, 
the, the same supplies as a master iconographer, the same brushes, boards, pigments, everything. But unless someone can show me what to do, those tools don't do anything. And the same is true with words. Right? Even the scriptures, in and of themselves, they're just words. You can make words mean anything. But if someone can show you, and if we can be humble enough to say, I want to know what these words mean. I don't want to define it. Show me. And then the world opens to us.